I want to just quickly say a couple of things and then I'll turn the floor over to Will. Uh, as you'll hear, it's the most remarkable synthesis of the pre-Socratic roots of philosophical materialism that led to the enlightened uh, me uh, mechanistic views. And then on to a critique of, the, uh, critique of those views opened up by Einstein and the new physics. It then applies this theoretical model to a very careful detailed analysis of the Abrahamic traditions with a focus on Adam, the classical mythology focusing on Prometheus, and then even uh, the Grail with the symbolism of the stone in Wolfram von Eschenbach. Uh, as Maria said, uh, he uh, essentially wrote two dissertations, if not three, because all three of these factors are done quite remarkably well. And I have to celebrate Will as a person having had the pleasure of having you in the classroom. Your uh, energy, enthusiasm, initiative, perseverance, determination, all those old-fashioned virtues uh, are exemplified by you. And uh, it makes me a little bit nostalgic for my youth and feeling my age more when I see you in action, but it gives me great hope for the future, for your own and for bringing mythological studies uh, into the world. So I'm going to turn the field over to you and hear and see your presentation. Thank you, Lance. You just have to sign. Thank you very much for that introduction, Lance. Uh, it means a lot to me just to know that the three of you even understand my work. Uh, and Devin, too, of course, and Britta sometime soon, I'm, I'm hoping, maybe in about 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it's, it's very meaningful to be able to even have conversation partners and to actually uh, be able to talk about this stuff. And on that note, I want to dedicate this defense to all the friends that I've ever had that have ever listened to me talk about this stuff, whether it's in a car ride by a campfire or in uh, serious situations. Uh, so thank you to all those friends that uh, are here and who can't be here and who are here by not being here. Uh, so moving into the, the uh, talk, um, I was actually thinking that I had to do a read, a protocol, standardized you know, read of the, of the uh, abstract to get going. Um, but since I don't have to, uh, and I've learned that, I'm, I think it's better to just skip it because I had all kinds of silly jokes planned about how hard it was to actually follow just reading it out loud, you know. Um, but I do want to start just lighting this candle. Maria, I can just describe this to you. Uh, Devin gave me this, and it's, uh, it's an apple with a fire inside. So to get started, we'll take the fruit of the fall and the fire of Prometheus, where my story begins, and put them both here. Thank you, Devin. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, don't let Jeff Abraham see that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so, skip the abstract, maybe we'll read it at the end or not, and since it gives me a little more time, I might open up uh, a little more, but I'm going to try and keep it concise, and I know that as soon as I start explaining anything, I run out of time for the whole thing. So, uh, so it means a lot to me uh, that, that you guys have come. This is, uh, I've been working on the dissertation for three years and following this line of thought since I was 17, really. And since I realized the existential and some of the existential potential implications of materialism, uh, and it ate at me really hard. And so, in my undergraduate years, I studied materialism and philosophy and science. And as a graduate student, I really dug into the religious and mythological stories and symbols surrounding materialism. And this dissertation uh, aims to synthesize my work as an undergraduate and graduate uh, with materialism. So. To simplify, there are really three hypotheses. As Lance was mentioning, there are three real things I'm trying to say here, and I thought it'd be nice and simple to just break down the three hypotheses and then, and then go through them one by one. The first is uh, better worded on the page, then I'm going to just make words up on the fly. So, Western origin stories of knowledge demonstrate initiations into the per perception of material isolation and isolated matter. And I'll explain more about what I mean by that in a moment. The second hypothesis is that the continuations of these knowledge narratives convey the transcendence of material isolation and the perception of matter is isolated. Then the third hypothesis is about how to go from step one, uh, 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 
a commitment to a materialistic way of seeing, to step two, which is a transcending of material limitation, that that fulcrum point has every, everything to do with waves. So the transcendence of material isolation and the perception of matter is isolated that these continuations of Western knowledge narratives convey is contingent with the integration of waves and elixirs. And we'll get more into all these. So the way that I designed my dissertation was really influenced by the scientific method, which is to kind of present what you're thinking about in the beginning, and then to go through the material as it is without you, uh, and then to come back to the material. So at this stage, I'm going to show you guys three videos of the three stories that I was working with. Uh, the first two are more direct, the mythological ones. I had to be a lot tighter with the story of philosophy just to, to get it in here. So enjoy these. I'm going to sit down with you. It's going to be about five minutes. Prometheus. Prometheus created humans and ignited the psyche. He counseled Zeus in his war against the Titans and created a black hole to imprison the fallen rulers. But once the Olympian monarch established his rule of order, Prometheus rebelled against his first decree, a flood that would kill all humans and wipe the slate clean for Zeus. By advising his progeny to fashion an ark, he saved the young race, until, at a feast, a rift was roused between gods and men. To resolve the issue and establish a bridge between disputing parties, he invented the burnt offering. Though this gesture became a ritual standard, for attempting to trick Zeus into receiving unwanted waste as a generous gift, humans were deprived of fire. In an act of necessary rebellion, the progenitor stole back the fire in a hollow fennel stalk, with which he delivered knowledge beyond instinct. How to work clay, wood, metal, numbers, and words to make art, food, and tools. This defiance of Zeus brought punishment upon Prometheus and his people. To humans he gave Pandora, not a woman like Prometheus' wife or his ally Athena. Hesiod presents her as a misleading fiend, a plague on humanity, a contorting influence on the human psyche. Once married to Epimetheus, Prometheus' brother, she opened the jar, mistranslated centuries ago as a box, and introduced suffering to human life. By this time, the human benefactor had been exiled to a rock at the edge of the world, to the place of the sunrise, where, chained to a stone, furious at Zeus, he foresaw the tyrant's downfall. And... For refusing to reveal the prophecy, a ravaging eagle was loosed on his regenerative liver. Still, true to his foresight, Zeus' own son later freed him from bondage. Okay, so let's do the story of Adam. I'll just tell you that the story of Adam is uh, mostly direct quotes that I've weaved together. Adam was made in the image of his creator, from the dust of the ground. The prime and progenitor of men was then brought to life with the breath of God. To resolve his solitude, God created Eve from his rib, face, tail, or shoulder. And as Milton describes, she was even more adorned and lovely than Pandora. In the Garden of Eden they named the animals and shared in paradise. God's only decree was their abstinence from the fruit of knowledge. The serpent seduced Eve into tasting the fruit, which she then shared with Adam. They hid from God, who, at midday, confronted the couple. He said, You transgressed of your own free will, through your desire for divinity, greatness, and an exalted state. Because you ate the fruit of the tree which I commanded you not to eat, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. He then cursed Eve with the labor of childbirth, and exiled Adam to labor of the field lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat forever. He said, Get ye down from the garden, both of you, all together with enmity one to another. On earth will be your dwelling place and your means of livelihood. Therein shall you live, and therein shall you die. They wailed and beat their chest for having been severed from the garden and entered the cave of treasures. Adam said to Eve, our eyes have become a flesh. They cannot see like they used to see before. The word of God is hidden from us, and the light that shone over us is so changed as to disappear. Look at this cave that is to be our prison in this world, in which darkness covers us, so that we are separated from each other, and you cannot see me, neither can I see you. 
At first they fasted, but eventually their bodies changed to conform with their material diet. According to the Asidi, Adam became troubled because his belly was inflated. God therefore sent a bird to him, which pecked at his anus and made an outlet. When Adam made love to his wife, she became pregnant, and Cain became the first to be born and the first to murder. As the earth rejected the innocent blood of Abel, Adam was the first to be buried in the earth. And today, Catholics, Coptic Christians, Syrians, the Georgian Orthodoxy, and all of those who jointly inhabit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre recognize, beneath the crucifix, an exposed crack and stone through which, when Christ was smitten by a spear, blood and water flowed from his side, down, into the buried mouth of Adam, to baptize and redeem the father of the fall. Check out this technology. According to Aristotle, Thales gave birth to philosophy. Oh, check out this technology. Yeah. That was reliable as ever. According to Aristotle, Thales gave birth to philosophy with his premise of reductive materialism, which became a crucial foundation to Western thought and the development of science. In Miletus, the same Eden of thought from which Thales emerged, Leucippus gave birth to the theory of atomism, which became similarly integral to Western thought and the development of science. Materialism and atomism were then championed by Aristotle, Epicureans, and the Stoics throughout Hellenistic and Roman history. According to some, atomism died out with Rome to be revived by Europeans who gained access to Arabic translations of ancient Greek sources. According to others, atomistic theory endured without disruption. Either way, atomism and reductive materialism became crucial to the development of European science and Newtonian physics which dominated the cultural worldview through the Enlightenment and continues to influence the way people think to this day. However, there have been many challenges to reductive materialism, and none more decisive than Einstein's contribution of general relativity. His theory that matter can be transposed into energy forever undermined the scientific belief in reductive materialism. Similarly, his synthesis of wave behavior with that of the particle, and what's come to be known as the photon, undermine the scientific belief in reductive atomism. These theories of Einstein's brought physics beyond the false foundations of particulated matter over 100 years ago, and by now, technologies that have emerged from his theories are conditioning contemporary individuals in ways that make the limitations of matter and the significance of waves far more recognizable. For example, the study of electromagnetic waves has resulted in the inundation of contemporary culture with radio, Wi-Fi, and satellite wave signals that carry virtual images and sounds beyond their material limitations. So that's the end of movie time. Uh, and we're going to go back through the three hypotheses, but you know, I just wanted to give you guys a chance to kind of refresh. I know these stories are well known and there are lots of details in them, uh, so I just wanted to uh, give you guys a chance to feel the stories on their own. Um, so, before I go through the, the three hypotheses, I need to distinguish the way that I'm looking at the re religious myths and the way that I'm looking at the historical philosophy. Uh, mainly, I'm taking a symbolic interpretation of the myths and then trying to support that uh, with, with uh, religious interpretations. So, for example, I'm looking at symbolic expressions of transcending matter, or and then I will look at the religious versions uh, within the same traditions. So, uh, say I'm looking at classical symbols of transcending matter, then I might reinforce that with an Orphic religious tradition from the classical world that has the same religious attitude. So that's the way I'm looking at this, the myths and, and religions, is really symbolically. And then the historical narratives are way more straightforward. You know, it's, um, we're looking at those historically, or that particular narrative historically. This is probably the most important uh, slide to land. And this slide is uh, about the the first hypothesis and the entry into materialism. So let's look at it mythologically and then philosophically. Mythologically, there are lots and lots of demonstrations and examples uh, that, that support this thesis, but I want to focus now, since we have limited time, on the three biggest and most central. And so first is just straightforward, the creation of humans from clay, from matter, you know. Uh, this is in the story of Prometheus, this is the story of, of uh, Adam and Eve, and it can be found all over the world. There's silly little stories like in 
shiny china, the different colors of clay result in different classes. Clay, humans made from clay, is pretty consistent all over the world, um, or can be consistently found all over the place. And it's consistent also with the contemporary stories of, of a robot receiving, uh, attaining consciousness, right? It's this idea of, of inert matter that's animated by consciousness. So you have it in the old Golem story, or the Frankenstein, or Pinocchio, uh, and I know Maria likes Spielberg's AI. Same idea, going back to Adam and Eve, uh, Deucalion, Pandora, these are humans made from clay, animated by consciousness. So as soon as consciousness, which presumably exists, uh, according, it's kind of implicit in these stories that consciousness exists in a way before it falls into the body, or maybe it's God's consciousness before it enters the body. And the idea is that once consciousness is in a body, it now has to live in an embodied world, which means eating and defecating, birth, death, sex, uh, the limitation by the sensory, uh, by the flesh senses, uh, and the isolation to the physical body, which implies various degrees of estrangement, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And also uh, what you find in these stories, the Adam and Eve story and the Prometheus and Pandora stories, that emphasize uh, all of these different pieces, you also find an emphasis on uh, new technologies. Uh, if it's in Adam and Eve, though there may be no mention of a technology, the images show them quickly using pickaxes to work the land. So, or adzes, I love the ads for Egyptian reasons. But anyway, then lastly, so not only is there a creation of humans from clay, a fall of consciousness into the material body, uh, but also into the material world, and it becomes, I think, the climax of the symbol of, of this entry into material limitation is in the actual restraint of the two progenitors to stone. So Prometheus is chained to, stone, to a stone mountain, and Adam is, is buried in a cave, stone cave. And actually, if we look at some real nice details and different variants of the, of the Prometheus story, you find he, he, in some versions, is also buried in a cave, especially in the Georgian version of Amarani. Um, so these are the three primary reasons why I interpret these myths as an expression of, of an entry into a materialistic mode of being and uh, materialistic reality and the recognition of those realities as limiting. And you also find that Prometheus is in despair for his uh, isolation, and that Adam and Eve, you know, beat on their chest and wail. So the uh, the estrangement, the emotional and existential estrangement, is very present in these stories too. So then, philosophically, scientifically, it's very straightforward. As mentioned in the story, uh, according to the to the way Aristotle has told the story and the way we like to tell it since, Thales was the first philosopher, and his first premise was that everything reduces to substance. Uh, there's a nice little twist about that. He actually says everything reduces to water, which I might interpret as waves, but uh, that's not how the story's told. The story's told that it began with materialism. Um, and it might be said, and Kieran made a great point in my dissertation, that when you just look at Thales, it's hard to say that he's really giving birth to materialism proper, that that's his main point. Uh, you might say that his main point is monism, uh, to look for one singular explanation of all things. but. Aristotle, his, his telling of the story and the continued telling is to really emphasize materialism. So, uh, then this, it's, it's actually in this same place in Miletus, in this Eden of philosophy, where the atom itself is, is conceptualized according to the story. Maybe it, was the, maybe it was Persians first, God knows. But the story, as it's told, is that uh, Leucippus came up with atomism in Miletus. Democritus visited him there and brought it to Athens. And where he, when he brought it to Athens, that's where... The, uh, that's where it got picked up by Aristotle, a fellow uh, Thracian. And it was, as much as it was hated by Plato, it came to change the, change the world and really spread. So classical atomism came to hugely influence the Western European world, and Newton, uh, probably the most important atomist since, since uh, Democritus, Newton, and this is really profound. This is something I focused on in my in my undergraduate uh, thesis. Actually, was that up until Con uh, sorry up until Newton, you ha you may have had this vague idea that everything is explainable by a logos. Everything is patterned. Everything can be scientifically or physically understood. But until Newton's calculus and his laws of physics and laws of momentum, that was not that you couldn't actually show it. Newton once and for all gave us a paradigm that was like. Holy, holy cow, that's really how the world works, physically, uh, mechanically. And it was so obvious that not only intellectuals picked up on it, but it empowered an entire uh, 
common sense movement that enabled uh, Europeans and Westerners to challenge religion with the strength of their conviction for the scientific paradigm, to challenge states. So during this time and, and ever since, you've seen the emergence of atomistic theories beyond atomism, the projection of atomism into everything, you know. And in our own field, you see it in Levi Strauss, mythemes, uh, but you've got phonemes and uh, memes and Hobbes. I, I, I hate the cover of the Leviathan, Hobbes' Leviathan, because it's a bunch of people that make up one big king. And so you have an atomized vision of humanity and, of course, this this hierarchical image. Anyway, so, so let's move on to the second hypothesis, uh, which, so moving past this idea that each of these three stories, the scientific, classical, and, and Abrahamic stories, uh, demonstrate an initiation into a materialistic way of being. So the second hypothesis is that we get past those limitations, that the stories continue, and when they continue, uh, they invert the setup, uh, just like a good inciting incident is inverted by the climax. Here it happens in these stories. And so... Uh, the progenitors themselves become freed from their material limitation. The guys who save them, Hercules and, and Christ, they also transcend uh, their material limitations and achieve atonement with the divine. And Einstein, uh, which we've said multiple times, and it's very simple, so we just say it simply over and over, but Einstein had a huge influence on, on uh, undermining the limitations of reductive materialism as well, which we'll talk about in a moment. So now to focus in on the mythological side of Hypothesis 2, uh, the liberation of progenitors is probably the most important part because I take the progenitors themselves as, as symbolic of uh, humanity uh, proper. Um, in the same way you might see that with Eve and Pandora, uh, just not following that thread right now. But Prometheus and Adam, who were both left at the end of their stories, chained and restrained to matter and, and stone, are freed by Hercules and Christ. And as mentioned, uh, this is, even though it's not in the New Testament, it's certainly in a lot of old stories about Christ and Adam, and it's, as mentioned, represented in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is inhabited by pretty much every denomination prior to the Protestant Reformation. So, uh, this, as mentioned, this, this transcendence from material limitation is... Um, followed through with the religious traditions. So in the classical world, the Orphics, Pythagoreans, Platonists, and others really continue this idea of the soul as imprisoned in the body and the need for the soul to transcend the body. But it's not just material and cosmological, it's not just metaphysical, it's not just about the soul being trapped in the body. It's about, especially when you look at the Pythagoreans, it's about the psyche and the way that we think being imprisoned by the influences of the material world. So our minds become corrupted by material limitation. And then you see it in the Abrahamic tradition with the Essenes, Cistercians, Sufis, and, and many more. Those are just an example of each of the you know, Judeo-Christian Islamic. And so looking at the actual characters of Heracles and Christ, there's this great story, the Stoics, uh, because even when it wasn't about transcending, your, even if you didn't believe in a soul and transcending the body, some of the classical philosophers still believed in uh, uh, transcending the influences of the emotions. Uh, so, so for the Stoics, they saw the lion skin that was on Hercules as symbolic of his divine body. And it was actually when he took off the lion skin and put on the cloak coated in blood that, according to the Stoics, symbolized flesh that he was able to die. So it was only with the fall into flesh for Hercules that he could die. And uh, just like Christ's body can't be found in the tomb and in the sepulcher, Heracles' bones disappear from the pyre. Um, so, each of these three, or each of these two, the, the liberation of the progenitors and the liberation of the heroes themselves uh, follow this transcendence from material limitation. Philosophically, uh, scientifically, as mentioned, the material limitation is transcended by, kind of once and for all, by uh, Einstein's theory equals mc squared. His relative his theory of relativity, which shows that matter is uh, trans. What's the word I like? Transmutable, Transmutable into energy, uh, and uh, <laughs> and and so once you show that matter is transmutable into energy, it's hard to maintain the idea that everything reduces fundamentally to matter as the absolute foundation and limitation of all things. 
And not only that, but we like to, uh, especially with the Newtonian paradigm, when we reduce everything to matter, we like to reduce everything to atomic matter. Um, and the theory of the atom, a nice twist, by the way, I didn't plan to mention this, but I can't help it. Einstein's given credit for proving the existence of the atom, even though he's also, as I'm about to explain, the guy that blew it out of the water. So he, based on this, this concept, called, this uh, behavior, uh, phenomenon called Brownian motion, he proved mathematically the existence of atoms, but then he also then showed with the photon, which was a name that stuck later, the synthesis of the particle and the wave in the behavior of a single entity he called a photon, and that undermined the uh, fundamental vision of matter as endlessly particulated. So that's the end of hypothesis two, that each of these, uh, the progenitors, the heroes, and the uh, scientific tradition all show an eventual transcendence from reductive materialism and material limitation. Finally, the third hypothesis is that the transition, the actual transition itself, uh, is the fulcrum for that transition is the wave or elixir. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so the progenitors, Prometheus, he's freed the, the actuating ultimate uh, agent that enables him to break free from the stone is the blood that's, that Heracles' arrow is dipped in that's, that kills the eagle that's defending Prometheus. And when you look at the old images, a lot of the old pottery, the liberation moment is the moment where he kills the eagle. They don't show him taking him off the stone, they show him killing the eagle. And the only reason he was able to kill that eagle is because of the Hydra blood, and it's that same Hydra blood that'll take his own life and free him from the flesh. But before we get to that, Adam is also freed by blood. It's when the blood trickles down from Christ to baptize Adam. So both of those moments of liberation are enacted by blood and fluids. So Heracles, uh, and Christ also achieve atonement, and when, when they and when they do, their atonement is also hugely influenced uh, and centered around waves and fluids. So, for example, Heracles' atonement, uh, like as mentioned, it's the it's the blood that uh, it's the hydra blood that enables him to die. But then it's also when he does die, when he achieves union with the divine, it's because and through the marriage to Hebe, the cupbearer of the gods, and it's through the drinking of the nectar. And uh, because of Lance, and because I was looking, uh, looking at actually a presentation that, that he gave, and he was talking about the Nakia, and talking about the prefix N-E, of course, uh, N-E-K, I looked up nectar, and it's like, uh, I wish I could remember the exact meaning, but it's like the staying off, it's like the putting off of that which is the underworld descent. It's like, it's like uh, that which frees you from the death of the Nakia. So anyway, the ne nectar is what enables... Uh, Christ to achieve, uh, uh, <laughs> Hercules to achieve union. And then you have uh, Christ himself, you have the wine at the Last Supper, the blood of the Passion, the blood wine of communion, and the blood wine of the Holy Grail are all symbolic of his liberation. And so whether it's the cup of the gods of Hebe or the Holy Grail, both of these great heroes are, and their atonement specifically is symbolized and, and in large part actuated by the elixirs themselves. And as mentioned, the uh, Einstein and philosophical and scientific tradition, when he uh, brings an end to the reductive materialistic thought, it is by integrating wave dynamics into the particle to come up with this idea that would become called the photon. So again, it's the actual integration of the elixir that enables the shift. So uh, to conclude, really there's, um, I'm really trying to show one major thing that the entry into and that each of the three traditions uh, combined to make somewhat of a consistent Western meta-narrative, which is an entry into and transcendence from material limitation by way of symbolic elixirs and or theoretical waves. And so ultimately, as, as cool as I think it is that, that there is a meta-narrative and is epistemologically meaningful as it is to find something consistent between the three traditions, uh, the question is, you know, why does it matter? And more specifically, why are waves or elixirs associated with transcendence? Why is the Holy Grail the, the symbol that it is? Why are the elixirs the symbol that they are, and, and most specifically in these stories? And so to get to this, uh, I've got to get to the very heart of this, of this dissertation and of my focus, and, and it really comes through in a certain thought experiment. So imagine a bunch of material entities, right? If you try and combine material things 
they inevitably will bounce off each other or break. Material things cannot share space. Just plain and simple. And my body, if I, if I see myself as my body, if I, re, if I project that back into myself, then I see myself as fundamentally isolated and unable to unify with anything. So if you get your sense of reality from your senses, from uh, a materialistic mode of seeing, and you limit your way of conceptualizing and understanding the universe to materialism and to, to this atomistic reductive attitude, then you will have no hope, no structure, no metaphysics, no form through which you can conceive of yourself as unified, through which you can conceive of yourself as one with anything. Because, again, things stay divided. If that's the case, and, and reality really is materialistic, we better just come to terms with this and accept our isolation. But, I came to realize when I was in a Plato class and as an undergraduate studying the Parmenides that the challenges of one and manyness are only challenges to material things. So, I realized uh, Pythagoras has this theory of, of the uh, harmony of the spheres, and I came to realize that it must have had a huge influence on Plato and his notion of harmony, and that Plato, in this riddling text where he's kind of teasing the problem out, I think that he's trying to get us to realize that, that the harmony, the music, is actually the solution to the problem of one and manyness. And let me explain what I mean. So, here, uh, if I have a microphone recording an entire symphony orchestra, every wave you could possibly create with every instrument there, they're all individual waves when they come off the string, but, but as soon as they hit the air, when they reach the microphone, they all combine as a single wave. Waves have no problem with one in manyness. So the microphone records a single wave, which goes through the wire as a single signal and a single wire, and comes out of a speaker as a single vibration. And how is it that just a circular speaker, a circular cone, can vibrate in one dimension and make all the music of an entire symphony? It's because waves don't have a problem with one in manyness. And so I believe that you know, one of the great secrets of the Orphix, one of the great secrets of, uh, of those who worship the lyre uh, and the grail, is that fluids, is that waves, are actually a form that enable union. And if existential union, if union with the divine, with lover, with God, with nature, with cosmos is important to you, <laughs> and it's important to me, then you need to have an actual metaphysic, an actual structure that can enable such union. And until there is a recognition of one, uh, you're forced just to deny the materialistic structure and fight against that. And I believe that the form of waves actually enable uh, such union. And it's not just union, of, it's not just me with, with anything, it's also to recognize that everything in nature isn't divided by its bits. Uh, if I just think materialistically, especially in the Enlightenment attitude, I see everything is fundamentally divided from everything else. And to me, this is the wasteland, this is desert, this is sand, which is just infinitely divided and inevitably, uh, uh, unhealably un, uh, isolated. But. <laughs> You water the desert, and you get the stories of the Nile. So ultimately, uh, to me, I, I came into this really thinking, okay, well, I, mean, I was 21 years old, lots of problems in the world, 2012's coming up, <laughs> what am I going to do to save it? We all, we've all probably been through some of that. And uh, I was thinking about how cool it was that the Buddha's wife was trying to uh, heal and feed people while the Buddha was trying to come up with some insight that would save uh, the world from an enormous amount of suffering with this breakthrough thought. So I was pursuing this and I, and I thought materialism is at the core and heart of, of our cultural, uh, cultural problems. And, but what I came to find, of course, you know, I wanted to write a dissertation that would change the world and do something absolutely breakthrough, some message that nobody ever heard before. And what I came to find in studying it is that these, uh, this message, I'm convinced, is, is a crucial message already embedded in the Christian tradition, already embedded and the classical trad tradition uh, coming through in our contemporary history. Uh, and, you know, ultimately I feel like it's uh, <laughs> more and more I explain this to people and it feels less important because materialism has less and less of a hold. Uh, so I came to realize that this, this may not be a dissertation to change the world so much as, as one to observe what's happening and that's where I'm at with it now. And uh, maybe I should just conclude by uh, this is my last slide. Yeah, I should just conclude by 
by saying thank you all for coming here. Uh, it's been great to be able to present to all of you. Thanks. Thank you.